We were looking how inspiration uses the agricultural model to explain spiritual truths. I'm sure all of us are aware of that. But we went to the book of Joel to give an example of that and I directed your attention that not only Joel 2.23 but the whole of the book of Joel was all based upon this agricultural model. So what we did, we looked at a few examples. A mountain equals Jerusalem, a dark cloud equals the northern army. We saw that a plant was God's people and the rain was his blessing. And when we did that, we saw all of that was a historical setting. So the plant was a symbol of the Hebrew people two and a half thousand years ago. The dark cloud, the strong mighty one, was a symbol of the army of Nebuchadnezzar. All of that is historical. So what we then did was to identify the fact the, the main reason why the book of Joel was even written was to teach us something about the end of the world. So, as an example, we saw that the northern army Nebuchadnezzar and his kingdom kingdom of Babylon becomes a symbol of the papacy at the end of the world. But I wanted us to see that in a systematic fashion. And so we did this simple diagram we saw two steps a historical step and a prophetic step in the historical step you have the natural pointing to the spiritual as you do in the prophetic step but in the natural or the historical you go from a cloud to um, a nation then when you go to the prophetic you take that same nation who was the symbolic representation of the cloud and it then becomes the natural pointing to the spiritual at the end of the world so when we first did that not many people seem to understand what I was trying to say. So I want to ask the question again. Say amen if you understand how this is now working. Okay, so a lot more people. So that's good. Just to reinforce this idea. We've seen that Joel employs both methods. Step one, history. Step two, the prophecy. So we'll take this model. Step one is which step? History. Historia. Step two. <laughs> Prophecy. Unabi. You're going to have the natural. 
and the spiritual. Let's look at God's people. What is God's people here in the natural? A plant, did we say? So we'll go with a plant. We could have gone with a fig tree or a vine. Shown it's a plant. And this equals what? Okay, so we've got God's people on this side, but I want to change that. Because this is two and a half thousand years ago. And who are God's people two and a half thousand years ago? The Hebrews. Are we okay with that? So then what are we going to do? We're going to turn this spiritual into a natural and then make a prophetic application. So I'm not doing anything that you don't do. But I'm just trying to formalize it. So that you can explain to people in a clear fashion the rules that we're using. So when you go from the simple, then you can start dealing with the more complex. Now, I'm not saying you have to diagram it this way, this is just the way I've chosen to do it. So here are the Hebrews, we might call them the Jews, we might call them, we could call them Israel, but I don't want to call them Israel. Why would I not want to call them Israel? Because Israel consists of how many tribes? Twelve. Now, remember in chapter 1, verse 2, it says, hear this, people, had this happened in your days. And the thing that's happened is an attack by the Assyrian armies upon whom? Upon the northern tribes. If you're new, you may not be familiar with this history. The northern tribes are ten tribes. How many would be left? Twelve. Oh, sorry, two. So, this story that's being spoken of is about the two tribes. Not all ten, uh, all twelve. So, this is the two tribes, which we might call Judah. It's Judah and Benjamin. Benjamin na, na Yuda. And who are these pointing to? Because this is the prophetic model. Who are the Hebrews at the end of the world? So we'll say SDAs, Adventists. That's a, an oversimplification, but Hopefully we can see how this is working. There are enough of you who are responding to this that leads me to believe that you understand how this is working now. I'll ask you the same question but it's Maybe the next step, a little bit more advanced. Can you see how much you can do just from a small book with three chapters? Yeah, 
And we're just scratching the surface. There's so much truth in this book. So all of us know about the Exodus. It begins with which person? Moses. And it ends with which person? Joshua. And Joshua begins a time period which we call what? The judges. Begins with Joshua and ends with who? Did we say Samuel? And then it goes from Samuel to which dispensation? And this is Saul. Samuel and Saul. After you get to Kings, we have Saul, David, and Solomon. Then the kingdom splits between ten and true. And this is led by Jeroboam. And this is Rehoboam. Even if you don't know the details, I think we all know this structure. It's something that we're all familiar with. So these kings run all the way down to the last king, Zedekiah. And these kings run to their last king, who was Hoshea. And they came to their end long before, long before Zedekiah. And I'm saying this event here, which verse is it in the book of Joel? If you're followed along. So chapter 1, we'll go with verse 2. When it said this, has this thing happened before? Total destruction of a people. And the answer was no. The answer was no. And then what God is doing in the book of Joel is he's going to explain to which people? The Hebrews. And who are these Hebrews he's talking to? The two tribes, these ones here, and he says, See what happened there here to who? To the ten, if you don't do what? If you don't repent from your sins, and what sins are they doing? They're doing the same ones as who? As the ten tribes. They just do it more subtly. But it's the same crime. And God warns them if you continue down this road, I'm, I'm going to send my army they had done this work and they're going to do this work upon you, upon Jerusalem. But if you repented, it doesn't need to happen. 
But Lakini, if it happens itatendeka, and then you repent, na kisha mkatubu, what will I do? I'll restore. So we can do a simple diagram. And I'll call this 70 years. We can mark the 70 years beginning a little bit before. And what happens? What's his 70 years representing? Captivity. They're going to go into captivity after Jerusalem is destroyed. And then what will God do? He says, if you repent here, then I will restore. So what we've done is we'll look at the book of Joel in its historical context and I've given you um, a line of uh, events so now I've introduced another concept that we should become familiar with first was parables you take the parable at step one in the historical setting then you take the parable at step two at the prophetic setting and then what we're doing now still looking at the same book and what we're trying to show is a story now if you have never looked at the book of Joel I don't mean if you've never read it because we've all read it <laughs> but if you've never studied it and I were to ask you when is the book of Joel? when is it written? so I'm going to do it like this so here's Joel and the question is where would I put Joel? now if I had asked you before this class most of you who have not studied this material before would not know Joel is one of those um, books which we call the Minor Prophets he's so minor people have no idea when he was doing his ministry because he doesn't tell you many of the prophets tell you when they were doing their ministry Joel doesn't so it'd be you'd have to do some research to find out but we've done an hour and ten minutes of studying on the book of Joel which is not very long and I'm saying if you've paid attention then you would know where to put the book of Joel every single one of us should be able to do that now and that's just after one hour of teaching so let's summarize chapter 1 verse 2 this what was the this it was the destruction by whom by the Assyrians and God said look at this this is about to happen to whom 
to you if you repented it would all be okay but if you don't repent I'm going to destroy who? this mountain which is who? Zion and Zion is Jerusalem so I'm going to destroy Jerusalem who is Jerusalem by the way? which tribes? so we can put all this information together then the second part of chapter 2 if you repent what will God do to the army? destroy it which verse? verse 20 chapter 2 and then what will I do? pour rain upon you to restore you so that's all the clues that we need to understand where to place the book of Joel but I'll give you one more piece of information talks about these four insects and now I'm just going to make a suggestion because I can't prove this just from this story what I have proven is this these four insects step one natural spiritual what did they equal? because we've proven this this is the army are we okay with that? so I'll just put the king of the north then what we'd have to do is bring it down step two king of the north and then we'd do this so we've identified that proven it through a contextual reading of the chapter understanding parables and proof texting in the chapter itself let the Bible define itself now what I want to suggest which I'm not going to prove is the number four it mentions four insects for a specific reason now we could study the number four and it would show us different things but I want to for your consideration give you two concepts or ideas of what this number four will lead to first of all I want to say it's in four steps so when I say four steps what would happen by the time you get to the last step total destruction so number four would be the end so I want to say the number four has two symbolic applications or ideas or thoughts number one it's something that's progressive and we can prove that in the chapter itself it says after this insect then this insect then this insect 
After the first syntax done its work, then the next will do some more destruction, progressive destruction. And it ends where? With the destruction of Mount Zion. And the second thing I wanted to see by the number four is it means what? means the end so it's going to come to the end or completeness so two concepts progression and completeness it can mean other things beside that so number one was what? progression and number two, complete. Now that may seem straightforward, but these two concepts become critical for us to understand at the end of the world. And you can get all of this from the book of Joel, from a few verses and whilst I said that I'm just going to suggest this now I want us to see you can actually prove this from the verses that I'm not guessing or making it up Say amen if you can do the following. Can you show that one insect comes after another? Say amen if you could do that now. So enough of us can do that. And say amen if you can show the by the time you come to the last and fourth insect it's all finished and God's people are going to be destroyed completely same if you can show that so what looked like my guess you can actually prove so we've proven all of this straight from the scriptures we haven't used any spirit of prophecy yet all we've done is use some rules read carefully and use some common sense and our God-given wisdom is very powerful for us to use okay so now is examination time where do we put the book of Joel so I'm going to start moving my pen and when you think I should stop just shout out so I want to see when the first person shouts. So I'm going to start here. I could have started b further back, but I'm assuming we'll start here. So you tell me, the first person tell me when to stop. Somewhere here? Here? Back? No, someone said to stop. Someone, who said to stop? You don't want me to stop? Okay, so someone said stop, but they're backing out. So I'll start again. I'm going to look who said stop now. I'm going to point them out. You tell me when to stop. I don't trust you people. Yeah? Stop. See, they said that. Did you hear that? Sister Norma told me to stop right here. I found her out. So she said stop here. So I'll carry on. People said not yet. Stop. Okay, so she did it twice. It's the doubling. So we've got we've got pretty much consensus. 
to put Joel here okay so uh, some of the people who shouted out I recognize their voices so I know they already know that because they've studied that they've already studied this subject so they know where to place it but hopefully for the rest of us who are new I'm hoping that you could see that Joel should go here and when I say here it would be in this history once the northern tribes no longer exist and be somewhere in this history how would you know where to place it in the history at the beginning the middle or the end where would you place it beginning say amen if it's the beginning the middle the end so lots of people say in the end so let me ask you the next question chapter 2 verse 1 in the King James it says nigh but it's the word near you say near <laughs> is near a Saheli word? okay so when is the destruction of Jerusalem near? At the end? Or at the beginning? If it was at the end, the destruction is here, not near. It's here. So it must be before the end. So it could be somewhere in the middle or the beginning so now we're going to use the number four there are these four insects that come eating their way through the land and we're coming up to insect number one and number one would be at the beginning so I'm going to put one, two, three, four. And now I want to add one more principle to number four. It means progression. And it means end. And tell me what's going to happen at the end. What happens here? Destruction. So the number four is also about destruction. It's a progressive destruction. Each insect destroys. So you get to the end, and the destruction is complete. I want, I want to illustrate to us how simple this message is, this prophetic message that we teach. Some of us in this uh, congregation have been studying these things for many years. Some of you for only a year and the rest of us in between someone here may be new may be the first time you've seen listening to these truths wherever you find yourself but especially if you're new I want you to think to yourself what am I teaching that you don't already know that's strange or new I took everything straight from the book of Joel 
I use principles such as parables that you're all familiar with. I took a historical story and brought it to the end of the world. Which all Adventists do. I showed you how to use the symbols. I showed you not to jump from the cloud straight to the papacy. Showed you some steps. Showed you how, how to understand the number four. All of these things we learn just in these two classes. But some of the principles that we've discussed if you can become familiar with them are the foundational principles to understand everything about this message. And you can learn it in a couple of hours. For each of us I want our week together to really be a school where you feel that you've been trained that you feel empowered to go to a book or a story and approach it using this systematic methodology you think about parables at two levels history and prophecy you read carefully you understand the context of where these original stories come from now the reason why most of you got the answer correct here except my sister is because what I did was give you a story all the way through because you all know this story they're the stories you read our children over and over again they're in our long term memory so as soon as I start, start talking about the ten tribes the golden the golden calves Jeremiah you all know those stories well all we added was just some history of Joel I asked you verse 2 what is the this and you told me it was here this then we read those verses in Joel and we saw them as a story not just as words or verses not to work out all the symbols chapter 2 verse 1 what do you have? a trumpet what's the trumpet for? it's a sound of alarm because an enemy is coming who's the enemy that's coming? Nebuchadnezzar when you, where are you blowing the trumpet? Who's blowing the trumpet? Joel is. So we're blowing the trumpet here. 
And this is a warning that destruction is about to happen. And every single one of us knows. God's people took, got taken into captivity. And they came out and were restored. So once you have a story, can you make a mistake? No. Once you get your parable correct and you read carefully you understand the story of the book then you see where the book fits into history a historical story you cannot make a mistake and this is another rule if you use two or three testimonies to prove something it becomes what? becomes established now in this movement I'm not talking about Adventism in general just this movement we know, we know about this rule Lots of Christians know about the rule. Christians know about this rule. It's not our rule. But in my experience, people in this movement don't use this rule. Properly. We use it, but not carefully. What I try to do is that every single step ask you if you agree, if you can see it, and then if you could copy or prove it. And when you say no, I said let's stop and go back. Until, until you get to the place where you can see that it's correct. So what I'm doing is we go along carefully. Subtly is making sure that every single one of my witnesses I want to make sure all of my witnesses are true and correct. Because if you're not happy with one of my witnesses like this picture I can't go to another evidence. If this is witness number one, we'll call all of this witness number one, the whole thing, witness one. And then I said, say this was witness two. If you never really believe this, I said, okay, don't worry about that one. We'll go to this one or another one and I say see this is my second witness because you don't like this one what am I doing? I'm breaking the rule because we've got to first show that this is witness one I'll go with this one then this would be witness two what if you don't agree with this? And I go to here. What witness number does this become? This only becomes one. So what do I have to find now? Second one. And the problem is, if you didn't like this one, you probably won't agree with this one. 
And then this witness na isn't a witness. Si and we do this all the time in our movement. We don't correctly establish our witnesses. So the way I approach this problem was by containing all of our discussion in the book of Joel. Therefore, Joel itself becomes the witness. All the stuff about Joel. So this piece of information, this, all of this becomes my first witness. And all that's based upon parables. Even this is all parable teaching, by the way. Then what I just did, to create my second witness, is this. So my second witness is this story. Parables and and stories. Once you can use them skillfully, you can establish witnesses. You know that Joel isn't here. We know that's not the case. Because the first major prophet was Moses. We know that. Then we'd have to try and work out where Joel would be. We know Joel is before the New Testament. So it's certainly from Joshua to Matthew. And then we have to try and read the history, understand the context to narrow down where we would find Joel. And we did that by creating this storyline and understanding some key verses carefully. The destruction is happening to Jerusalem. It's a northern army. If it's a northern army, there's no northern armies in Judges. Not when we understand what the northern army is referring to. So we can begin to narrow our stories down. So I want us to see that storytelling is a powerful way of making sure that we come to the correct answer. And that's why all of us, in just two short classes, can show Joel goes here. Now you might say, what's the point of all of that? Because one of my brothers or sisters here could have taken us to a spirit of prophecy quote and they could have located that in about two minutes. Easy to do. But if you did that, you lose the ability to be trained on the simple stories. And when you get to a complex story, the Ellen White won't be able to help you with, what will you do then? You'll be stuck. So this is why we, the I am encouraging us 
to study carefully. And now, we could show a spirit of prophecy quote and it would locate this here to the very year and it would fit in exactly the same place where we have put it so this was meant to be as an introduction an encouragement for us to begin to study carefully and contextually I want to just add in one or two pieces more that we can still get from this book you remember I say remember we haven't quite done this what verse is this at the end of the captivity what verse is that so this is 220 and what we know is happening here after the destruction of Babylon God's people are restored back to their country by the Medes and Persians and so what we can show or what we've observed is that the symbol of the natural number 220 which we can say is 220 has a spiritual application and it's right here restoration so we've done this a number of times those of us who have studied these truths and we can identify that when we see this number 220 it points us to this concept or this idea of restoration so hopefully we can see that and it's not too difficult for us for us to understand I just want to check something if I can find it quickly if I can't I'll move on Okay, I'll find it for my next presentation. I want to just uh, give us some some information about this 220. If we were to proof text, and I'm hoping all of us understand what proof texting is. I'll give us a simple example. You take the word Sabbath and you can find that word used in various different places in the Bible. If you want to understand what the Sabbath is, you find the word Sabbath and you see it in different verses, you bring them together and it helps you to understand what the Sabbath means like don't work um, it's a holy convocation how you should eat on that day 
when it begins and when it ends then there's a prophetic application of the Sabbath so there are many things you can learn about Sabbath if you proof text now this is a valid and correct methodology to use but if you don't use it carefully you can make mistakes and it becomes dangerous so if we were to go to the book of Joel and you went to verse 4 it picks up the word locust and if you have studied um, that verse in the past even though it mentions these different insects if you read carefully you'll see that these are basically different forms of locusts either different types or in their different growth stages and so if you wanted to know what's being spoken of in the book of Joel you might decide to proof text the word locus and it wouldn't take you long to go to the New Testament go to the book of Revelation and you would see that those locusts in Revelation chapter 9 are symbolized by an army warriors on horseback and if you're familiar with these charts you'll notice that we have these warriors on horseback in both charts and if you look carefully it says these are the Mohammedans which is a, an ancient name for Islam because they're followers of Muhammad so you might come to the conclusion that when you run this all the way through we could have put the cloud but we could also put these insects just here and they're locusts so when you run through this story you might be inclined to say it's Islam not the papacy so how would you know which one it is because one of them has been proof text and the other one we've used parables historical setting this carefully laid out storyline and we, and we know it's the king of the north so we said it was a papacy the other way to do it is to proof text the word locust you come to Revelation 9 and you say it's Islam who's right and who's wrong hopefully we can see the dilemma now the obvious answer is that we're right the proof texting would give you the wrong answer 
kuchunguza itakupatia jibu lisio sahihi and to know that to be true na kujua ikiwa ni sahihi first of all kwanza you have to have laid out all this information and be sure about it unapaswa kumetumia ujumbe huo na kuwa na uhakika nayo because then what you would have to do is to build on that kwa kwa zaidi utakavyo fanya ni ku And what we have got a very bad habit of is not establishing and creating proper witnesses. So what witness have I established all through this study? Which everyone agrees on. It's this. When God's people sin, who punishes them? King of the North. Now based upon that principle, we can create and develop a first witness that we can then we can prove and establish. We would then need to go to another completely different story. Follow all the same principles. And what we would do then is we'd look at another group of people who were in apostasy and how God will punish them with his army. So we established God's people do what? Sin. And then who punishes them? King of the North. And if you want to make the King of the North in history Islam in prophecy you have to demonstrate that. So what we need to do is not run a story in the book of Joel which is a story about God's people and the king of the north you have to find a story about whom? Islam and if you check carefully we're not going to go through this you'll see that Islam has a role to play which is very similar to the role of the king of the north and what you'll see is that Islam is used to punish a group of people when they do sin and that group of people is Rome and Rome is whom? the king of the north so you can show that the role of Islam is to punish Rome the king of the north when it sins and the role of the king of the north is to punish God's people when they sin we establish this just from Joel we could have established it or reinforced this with many more stories so this one 
is not so easy to do here we have to develop it from multiple histories but I would say this was Revelation 8 and 9 once you understand what these stories are in chapter 8 and 9 you can demonstrate this by the way 90% of that is in full agreement with every Adventist it's not some strange idea that we have that's unique to us so once you had these two stories both developed using proper methodology you just ask yourself the question in Joel who's doing sin God's people or the king of the north so it must be the king of the north not only in the parable at step one history but also in the parable at step two prophecy then you go to Revelation 8 and 9 and if you're familiar with those chapters which some people are not and you ask why is Islam this warrior on a horse attacking people and if you check the verses in the history it's because a people, a group of people have sinned and the people who have sinned are Rome two different stories but look how similar they are and look how easy it would be to make the book of Joel to make these locusts Islam but if you follow carefully laid out rules it would save you from making these grievous mistakes so I want us to see how relatively easy it is to study the word of God how we can come up with really firm conclusions by reading carefully using parables correctly confirming them with histories or stories and then using the spirit of prophecy or pioneer writings as we go through our studies this week from the newest member here to the ones who have been here for a long time I want all of us to feel empowered to the degree that we're able to that we could begin to study for ourselves that we could begin to develop the character that we need to prepare us to stand at the end conflict because God's church is about to go into captivity and be taken down and we're told that a remnant will be restored so if you want to be part of that remnant you need to have a spiritual experience with God 
But before you have that, first you need to have an intellectual experience with God. If you want to stand and be restored here, our minds need to be strengthened in the study and meditation of God's Word. And it will produce a corresponding experience in us. Either we will be coming, we will be formed into the image of God or the image of Satan by the study of these truths. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we want to ask for a special blessing to be poured upon every single one of us. Lord, we recognize our weakness and our frailty but you have come down to us you've seen our weaknesses and you're here to strengthen us we thank you that you send your son who was created when he came here to earth and took a form similar to ours showing us Lord that what we are capable of doing if we like him surrender ourselves to the work of the Holy Spirit. We ask for a, a blessing upon the truths that we're handling. May they be an encouragement to us. And as we begin to understand them spiritually, may they have the desired spiritual effect upon each and every one of us. It's our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.